Disappearing rainbow corridors, a seemingly limitless number of hidden Mickeys, and Kurt Russell? Disney World loves a good story, but not every story is tied up with a nice, neat bow. Welcome to Disney World Unsolved. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. Today we're digging deep into the unsolved mysteries in Disney World. I'll be taking you through the history behind attraction disappearances, audio animatronic head scratchers, and certain situations that Walt Disney himself took to his grave. Pop some popcorn for this one, cause it's gonna get good. All right, we're starting with what happened to the Rainbow Corridor. Those of us who are 80s kids remember the Rainbow Corridor with absolute love, and we would absolutely love to see it again. So here's the history. Figment is kind of a big deal at Epcot, ergo the six hour line for his popcorn bucket, that's a mystery in its own right. Despite Figment's popularity, the journey into imagination with Figment Ride has developed quite the controversy over the years. Quick recap for those of you playing catch up. Basically, Journey into Imagination used to look a lot different back when it originally opened in 1983. Instead of an exploration of the creative dream port alongside Dreamfinder and Figment, we now have a tour of the Imagination Institute's sensory labs with Nigel Channing and still Figment. I don't care which version you prefer, but I think we can all collectively agree that Nigel Channing's face on the moon has no right to be that terrifying. Nope. But the unsolved mystery doesn't directly have to do with this drastic ride change or with Nigel Channing's face. Unless you're sitting here trying to figure out how the butterfly disappears in the sight lab, it's all about mirrors, folks. So there's one mystery actually solved for you. No, the mystery actually has to do with what you could do after the ride once upon a time. In the upstairs portion of the old Journey into Imagination ride, you can explore a section called Image Works. Technically, you can still do this at the now Image Works, what if labs, but much like the Journey into Imagination ride has drastically changed, so has the interactive play area after the ride. And one of the biggest changes of them all has to do with the Rainbow Corridor. If you visited Epcot back in the 80s or 90s, and you might remember this vibrant tunnel of colors and light. It was a big pull for the area, and even Michael Jackson got in on the action and did a full on photo shoot in that color sensory maze. And even more important, my brother has a picture in the rainbow tunnel, so how cool is that? But when Image Works moved from the upstairs to the downstairs part of the ride building, the colorful tunnel did not go with it, despite its overwhelming popularity. So here's the mystery, where did this rainbow corridor go? We'd say it ventured off somewhere over the rainbow, but that'd be tasteless and redundant. Some say that the tunnel is still intact, walled up somewhere upstairs, where the now DVC member lounge resides. Some say it's been dismantled, put away quietly with no word on when or if it'll ever be reconstructed constructed. And others say it's probably in the Walt Disney archives, which could make sense since they've currently got the old dream machine from the OG journey into imagination over there. But for now, the truth is we haven't seen or heard about this once glorious tunnel since it originally vanished back in 1998. So here's what we do know. Epcot is in the middle of a massive transformation. Journey into Imagination hasn't been added to the big plans, but that doesn't mean Disney's sweeping this one little spark under the rug to be forgotten about. Figment is still the face of Epcot, especially around the time when the Festival of the Arts is taking place. He's on spirit jerseys, mugs, pins, and popcorn buckets so many popcorn buckets, and so is his rainbow-like aura. But just because Figment likes to stir up the drama, I know it's not your actual fault, Figgy, it doesn't mean adding this rainbow corridor back into the park is the main concern of Disney right now. Walt Disney once said that the Disney parks would always be in a state of becoming, which is exactly what Epcot is focused on currently. They're focused on adding new rides like Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind, and new experiences like Moana's Journey of Water. But if you need a little extra rainbow in your life, Epcot still has you covered. We gotta see a projected rainbow stretch across Spaceship Earth during the Festival of the Arts. We're not crying, you're crying. And now there's a ginormous rainbow spread of flowers covering the grounds during Flower and Garden Festival bringing an array of color and life to the park that we know Figment has got to appreciate. So, although the Rainbow Corridor is no longer around as far as we know, its prismatic essence still lights up for you. Who got that pun? Did you? Okay. Next mystery that no one has solved. Who is the mysterious child on the Carousel of Progress? Okay, the history. Have you met John's family yet? Now you know John, narrator from the Carousel of Progress in Magic Kingdom, sings a great big beautiful tomorrow song, gets stuck in your head. That John, yeah, he's got a nice little family for himself. He's got his wife Sarah of Rumpus Room fame, his son Jimmy, his daughter Patricia, Rover the dog, Grandma and Grandpa, and of course Uncle Orville, who gets no privacy at all around this place. And that's it, that's the whole family. But are we missing someone? Oh, that's right. 
her. The show is initially set during the turn of the 20th century, meaning we're getting introduced to a lot of nifty little gadgets like gas lamps, cast iron stoves, and the brand new icebox that helps keep food from spoiling immediately. And what's Sarah doing during all this? She's working on ironing the laundry, but she's not doing all that work alone. She's got a little helper with her, a small girl with two pigtails keeping herself busy with a spinning machine. The girl doesn't say anything, just minds her own business, spinning away. But in the very next scene, poof, she's gone. So the mystery, who is this mysterious child that only shows up to help wash clothes before she's a goner? Could she be another daughter of John and Sarah who just doesn't show back up ever again? Is she a neighborhood kid who moved away by the second act? Or maybe she's a long lost cousin that winds up lost again? Timeline jumping will do that to you. Strangely, all the other characters on stage have specific roles in the family as well as speaking roles, and she just doesn't. And then she just doesn't show up for the remaining three scenes. But maybe we're thinking too much into it? After all, according to the Disney website, this attraction is all about showing off the evolution of technological progress during the 20th century. And that's exactly what this little mysterious girl does. As Sarah brags about the new wash dry marvel that allows her to get the laundry done in five hours instead of two days, the girl demonstrates what this spinning wheel mangle actually looks like while operational. So her main purpose in this production could be just as simple as that, showing off another new piece of technology at the turn of the century. So what do we know? Well, the Carousel of Progress has undergone many changes over the years. According to the D23 website, this attraction originally opened for the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair under the General Electric sponsorship, then opened in Disneyland on July 2nd, 1967. Though the Disneyland version of Carousel of Progress closed back in 1973, the Magic Kingdom version has rooted itself in the Tomorrowland area since 1975, and yes, the mysterious little girl has been around that long too. There are other mysteries tied to this attraction, like when will this historic 21-minute show receive some tender love and care again, since its animatronics have seen better days most certainly. Bria says she's seen a run-through of this show where John's head was completely turned the opposite way like he was part of The Exorcist. And I've also been there when there was zero audio, but we had to watch the show play out anyways, and that was actually pretty fun because the audience was filled with guests who already knew the audio by heart, so we all worked together to fill in the blanks. Teamwork makes the dream work, or in this case, the show work. Even on the days when this attraction is a little worse for wear, it's still a fantastic escape from the Florida heat. The attraction never sees intense crowd levels like Space Mountain or Seven Dwarfs Mine Train does, so if you want to experience a classic Magic Kingdom attraction with little to no weight and 20 solid minutes of air conditioning, this is a great stop to kick back, relax, and enjoy a trip back in time. You can also create your own theories behind who the little girl in pigtails is, because all we know for sure about her is she kicks butt doing laundry. Okay, next mystery for us, how many hidden Mickeys are there really? Well, the history is that you'll see them in the walls, the carpets, the greenery. Some are obvious, some not so much, but you can't escape them, not even in your own hotel room. But don't sweat it, guys. What I'm talking about isn't as scary as it sounds. I'm talking about three circles coming together to make one of the most popular scavenger hunts throughout all of the Disney parks. According to the D23 website, hidden Mickeys were originally created by Disney Imagineers back in the early 1980s as an inside joke, and that's kind of Epcot's fault. All Ears Net covered a post that shouted out Jim Hill, an award-winning writer and co-host of the Disney Dish podcast. He stated that originally Disney didn't want a lot of Mickey Minnie influence in the Epcot Park. But Imagineers thought it'd be fun to add the mouse who started it all throughout this new park in more subtle ways by hiding his signature silhouette in different attractions, rides, walkways, and everywhere. Guests quickly caught on to this game and had a fun time scouting out our good pal and all the different nooks and crannies of the park. And after that, Hidden Mickey seemed to spread their way across the other parks and resorts too. Now the mystery is, if you've ever been to a Disney park, you've probably tracked down a Hidden Mickey or two before. But how many Hidden Mickeys actually exist out there? Is there a way anyone can track them all down? Can anyone truly be a Hidden Mickey completionist? The closest we've ever come to this prestigious status is of course Steve Barrett, aka the Hidden Mickey guy. He's the creator of several Hidden Mickey guidebooks. According to an interview Barrett had with ABC News back in 2010, he'd collected well over 1,000 Hidden Mickeys at the time. Just imagine how many new ones have been added to the park since then, and believe me, Steve's got them all. And the real tricky thing about getting an exact head count, so to speak, of Hidden Mickeys is a thing I like to call Phantom Mickeys. The three-circle figure isn't uncommon. In fact, you've probably been able to track down hidden Mickeys even outside the parks. In the clouds, in the weird grooves on the ceiling, in the spaghetti stain on your shirt. You'll probably need a bleach pen to get that one out, by the way. D23 mentioned that guests enjoy tracking down hidden Mickeys so much that they often find them in places that the Imagineers had no hand in creating, making them more of a design fluke and less a part of the actual search and find. Because of this, it's really hard to pin down an exact number of purposeful, Imagineer-designed 
Hidden Mickeys, especially as Disney continues to change and expand their rides, attractions, and overall sections of the parks. Shiny new sections equal new Hidden Mickeys, both phantom and legit. So here's what we know. Look, you can track down Phantom Hidden Mickeys all day if you'd like. It's really interesting when you leave Disney World that you kind of see Hidden Mickeys all over the place for a little while. But if you're looking for some real, genuine Hidden Mickeys, here are a few you can track down during your next visit. If you decide to shop around the Discovery Trading Company in Disney's Animal Kingdom and you wander into the Footprints Room, look above the door. The Tree of Life painting might have hundreds of animals carved into it, but there's a very special little guy carved into the trunk directly above the waterfall. Okay, that one was tricky. Want some more obvious ones? Then head on to the rides featured in the land section of Epcot. On Soarin', you'll be able to see Spaceship Earth transform into one giant hidden Mickey thanks to the help of some well-placed firework explosions. And on Living with the Land Boat Ride, you can find several different plants that take on a hidden Mickey shape, like those pumpkin and spinach plants. And you'll even be able to spot a hidden mini in the horizontal shrimp tank at times. Now, some hidden Mickeys just aren't fair. Back in 2021, we had a reader find a hidden Mickey while they were on Tower of Terror in Disney's Hollywood Studios during a ride breakdown. When the emergency lights came on, our reader was in the welcome back room where they were able to take a detailed look at all the clutter and spy a very, very, very faint pair of Mickey ears drawn onto a rather eerie looking picture. I'd still take that picture over Caesar the Dummy though. And remember our good friend Carousel of Progress? Hidden Mickeys are a plenty there, but one of our favorites can be found in the last scene. See those salt and pepper shakers at the kitchen counter? What do they look like to you? Next on our mystery list, what is the origin story behind the Hatbox Ghost? All right, here's the history. A silly spook sitting by my side? Sure. Awesome. Best day ever. Caesar the dummy sitting by my side? Nightmare fuel on my worst day of my life. And although I'd say I'd take the Hatbox Ghost in Disneyland's Haunted Mansion over Caesar the dummy any day of the week, the Hatbox Ghost's uneasy and rather morbid, ever-changing backstory is enough to make me second-guess myself. But first and foremost, let's discuss who developed the original design for our spectral friend. According to the D23 website, Yale Gracie was originally hired on to the Walt Disney Studios team as the layout artist for classic Disney films like The Three Caballeros, Fantasia, and Pinocchio. By 1961, Gracie shifted his role in the company over to Wed Enterprises, where he became an Imagineer for special effects and lighting. Yale Gracie had a lot of wins in his career. He helped create Carousel of Progress, and he also had a hand in developing the burning city in Pirates of the Caribbean and the glittering star illusion you'll find in Space Mountain, which helps disguise the rest of the roller coaster and make you really feel like you're traveling through deep space. Along with these attractions, Gracie worked on the animatronics for the Haunted Mansion. The grim grinning ghosts were a huge success, but his other see-through friend, the Hatbox Ghost, not so much. According to a 2015 post from the Los Angeles Times, Gracie was never satisfied with the Hatbox Ghost's special effects. The ghost's head was supposed to disappear from his neck and reappear in a, say it with me, hat box. And if you've ridden Disneyland's Haunted Mansion anytime after May 9th, 2015, you're probably going, yeah, that's exactly what the Hatbox Ghost does. But the original Hatbox Ghost, the one that was present on opening day, was taken out soon after the ride made its official debut in 1969 because the effect just wasn't working quite as Gracie wanted it to. The Hatbox Ghost was later revived, as much as a ghost can be revived, I guess, and was put back into the Haunted Mansion in 2015. Much rejoicing ensues, and it's a really, really cool effect. So here's the mystery. The Hatbox Ghost returned to the ride. Mystery solved, right? Sure, we know where the Hatbox Ghost is now, but have you ever taken the time to think about who the Hatbox Ghost is? Let's go back to the LA Times post I mentioned earlier. In a 2015 interview conducted by the LA Times featuring former Disney Imagineers, many of them were asked about the origins behind why the Hatbox Ghost is the way he is. After all, we kind of have a solid understanding of ghosts like Constance Hatchaway, whose many, many, many husbands seem to have lost their heads during their marriage. But what's the Hatbox Ghost's dealio? Apparently, the story changes depending on who you ask. The biggest theory that was actually on a promotional album released by Disneyland Records back in 1969 had the Hatbox Ghost connected to our dear Attic Bride, which makes sense, right? Headless ghost, ghost that chops off heads. Seems like they go hand in hand. Also, they're both up there in the attic together. And to further connect these two ghostly friend stories, modern day Imagineers have hat boxes scattered around the attic where Constance Hatchaway does her bidding. When the Imagineers brought the hat box ghost back to his haunted home, could they have developed his backstory even further? Sure, but the Imagineers decided that the more vague approach was the more interesting approach. 
After all, Walt Disney himself didn't have an exact story he wanted played out for the Haunted Mansion in the first place, so why should our headless friend need one? Now guests can create his story themselves. Here's what we know. Yale Gracie was a pro-illusionist that created a bunch of the effects we still see in the Haunted Mansion rides to this day, but thanks to the ambient lighting the ride uses to give off its spooky, scary vibes, the Hatbox Ghost's magic trick, so to speak, never quite worked for him. Thanks to projection mapping, that, that's now used on several Disney animatronics like the characters on Frozen Ever After in Epcot and the dwarfs on Seven Dwarfs Mine Train in Magic Kingdom, the Hatbox Ghost was finally able to wow guests with his disappearing head act after his own disappearance act for 45 years. If you're wanting to visit the Hatbox Ghost, you're only going to find him over in Anaheim, California, but he's there all year long now. He's even there during the Halloween Christmas season when the ride has its Nightmare Before Christmas overlay. You'll find him getting into a holiday spirit with festive influences featured on his top hat and a Santa cap on his stack of hat boxes. All right, our next mystery, what's the deal with Walt Disney and Kurt Russell? Well, when it comes to Hollywood, Kurt Russell gets around. You might love him for his more innocent roles, like his voiceover as Copper in The Fox and the Hound, or you might hate him for his villainous roles, like when he played Ego, the god dad of Star-Lord in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. But when it came to Walt Disney himself, Walt admired the young Kurt Russell bunches. According to an article featured on the Huffington Post, Walt Disney passed away in 1966 when Kurt Russell was still a teen, but the teen's influence on Walt was with him till the very end. Not only was Kurt Russell's name the last thing Walt Disney reportedly ever uttered, but it was also the last thing he ever scribbled down. So here's the mystery. What was Walt Disney trying to get across that had to do with the young actor? When the Post interviewed Kurt Russell about the bizarre mystery back in 2017, Russell admitted he's still baffled by what Walt Disney was trying to convey convey in his last moments. In fact, he didn't learn about Walt's last words until a couple of years after Walt's passing. Though the Post mentioned there's been a lot of speculation that Walt Disney was trying to discuss an upcoming role for the actor, Russell still isn't quite convinced that's all Walt's last words were leading up to. After all, Russell considered Walt a second grandfather of sorts. He played games with him, took tours of the studio with him, and was even given minor league baseball advice by him. So yes, maybe Disney was trying to assign Russell to one last show-stopping role, but there's also the possibility he wanted to give the young teen he admired one last piece of advice. So here's what we know. Kurt Russell is considered a Disney legend to this day, according to the Disney Parks website. He's not only influenced several Disney films after Walt Disney's parting, but he's also made appearances time and again at the Disney Parks, even going so far as to hold meet and greets with DVC members in the past, as well as narrate for Epcot's Candlelight Processional in 2017. Aside from acting, Russell considers himself a wine connoisseur. He even crafted an award-winning wine with his fellow celebrity friend, Goldie Hawn. His wine brand has been featured in the past food and wine festivals at Epcot and top tier restaurants like La Celia and Napa Rose. So whatever Walt Disney was trying to get across by writing Kurt Russell's name down and saying his name allegedly, Kurt Russell has definitely made an impact on the Walt Disney Company. Now to wrap things up here, I got to throw out a quote from Disney Imagineer Raleigh Crump, who was interviewed for the whole Hatbox Ghost debacle for the LA Times. Crump stated that the reason Disney mysteries work so well is that they keep things elusive, opening up guests' imaginations to wonder what's really going on behind the scenes. It's because people love mysteries, said Crump, especially a mystery from Walt Disney. And hey, we can't disagree there. Though many Disney historical facts still puzzle us to this day, our team has still been able to solve quite a lot of important mysteries, like how to escape from Disney crowds and how to snag that coveted advanced dining reservation. Y'all know the vital stuff. So stick with us and we'll continue to provide answers to questions that you have about your upcoming trips, because those things should not remain a mystery. And we've got all the answers for you. Thanks for listening, everyone. And thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.